everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. Really excited to have a wonderful uh, podcast today, webinar. And we have, have a special treat. Uh, Dr. Stephen Tedesco is going to be talking about helium. And if you haven't seen his book on helium published by Elsevier, it's available. And it's available in ebook form as well as, as basic printed copy. And um, Dr. Tedesco has been involved in helium for a long time. He's also uh, produced gas in the area of helium and also is currently interested in hydrogen, geologic hydrogen. So he'll be talking about that today as well. And I just want to say that um, I want to thank the Energy Minerals Division for supporting helium and also to the uh, Division of Environmental Geosciences they, they are also um, big supporters of, of this webinar series. AAPG will make this available to you uh, as a recorded link in, in YouTube, and I'll send a link via email in, as soon as I have this um, up and ready, and just really excited about it. So want to say thank you, and also want to encourage everyone to renew your membership and also to continue to at attend the webinars. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming to listen to me talk. It's certainly uh, nice to be able to chat with people about helium. It's a unique opportunity. We'll talk a little bit about hydrogen, uh, but that's in early stages, And but we do see hydrogen sometimes with helium in the well bores, so it's always interesting. So what do we use helium for? Uh, cryogenics is the primary use right now. Inert atmosphere for growing silicon and germanium crystals, computer chips, manufacturing fiber optics, pressurizing and purging, cooling medium for nuclear reactors, welding, leak detection, synthetic breathing mixtures, lifting uh, blimps, fusion, uh, which needs a boatload of helium if it ever is gonna work. And then finally, which is not on here, party balloons, which is probably what most people recognize it for. And uh, without our kids getting party balloons, I think the world might come to an end. But anyway, uh, we can break down the uses into a pie chart. And as you can see, there's magnetic NMRs or MRIs um, constitute quite a bit. Um, use of the gas for uh, welding, use of the gas for um, Cryogenics is critical. It's it's very inert. You can use nitrogen in some cases, uh, but this is uh, this gas that gas along with argon is more difficult to get the uh, best results that helium gives. What happens if there's no MRIs, no helium? And what happens to the manufacture of computer chips? Um, basically, the present society or civilization would come to a grinding halt. We'd be back in the 50s and 60s somewhere. So we'd have the uh, laptop computer at your bottom right hand of your screen. That would be your laptop for the future. So it's very critical. And as computer chips get more complex and smaller and smaller, helium allows an atmosphere which they grow grow the chips in to be uh, very reliable, um, very uh, flaw free. So what is helium? Well, it's the second most common element after hydrogen. It is basically two protons and one to two neutrons. It occurs either as helium-3 or helium-4. Helium-3 is not very common. Right now, it's pretty much generated by um, uh, nuclear reactors that the US and Russia has. And that's where, you, if you want to buy helium-3, you can get it. Helium-4 is far more abundant and is what we use in all of the um, applications that I just discussed. The concentrations are very low. Um, boiling point is very low. Basically, it never gets, it never freezes and the density is it's lighter than air. Chemically inert and non-reactive. So as we will discuss, one of the problems for finding helium accumulations is, unlike let's say oil and gas or gold or silver, there's no uh, elements that it reacts with to act as pathfinder tools. Uh, it doesn't uh, really react with anything except under very extreme conditions that are always temporary. And gas with the, has it has a very high thermal conductivity. So it's a great gas for a lot of non, uh, a lot of inert uses. What is the origin of Earth's helium? Well, it's a combination of being trapped when the Earth was formed, and then 
generated from ura uranium and thorium uh, through decay, also lithium, which I forgot to put in the slide. Um, essentially, the uranium and thorium is generally found in granites in the upper crust, or actually the crust in the upper mantle. The lithium can be found in a variety of rocks in the crust. Uranium and thorium also can be found in Paleozoic or any sort of uh, carbonaceous shales or mudstones uh, where we see a lot of the oil plays happening right now. Interestingly enough, uh, we don't see any helium accumulations or presence in these shale plays, uh, especially oil ones. So it's interesting that we don't have those. Uh, the helium that we have when it leaks out of the earth, it just goes up into the space and it can actually theoretically go from the earth's surface to space without hit, hitting another uh, molecule. Reserves and production, it's very interesting. Uh, the U.S. is basically uh, still the number one leader in producing uh, helium in the world. The graph on the upper uh, left shows that Qatar in the U.S., and the U.S. is actually listed as two different uh, parts of the graph there. But Qatar is uh, going to be adding a fourth train, which is basically a fourth facility, and start increasing their helium out of the north and south parse field. Over the years, as you can see on the graph in the upper right, uh, basically it's the U.S. that's produced until the 1990s when other countries started uh, putting, putting out their own helium because of the uh, uh, strategic uh, element uh, being critical to society and a variety of other things. The military consumes a lot of helium too, as well. And we have countries now that are coming on, like Canada is becoming a, uh, um, it's on its way to becoming a major source of helium. Um, they think they were projecting 8% of the world market eventually. And that that's really left up to um, how the exploration and development goes up there. And it seems to be going okay, uh, some dry holes, but also some good producers. In terms of state, it used to be Kansas and Texas. Now it's shifted to Wyoming and producing most of the uh, helium for the U.S. Uh, Kansas still producing a lot. So is Texas basically out of the Hugoton, which is, even though it's in decline, is uh, still producing a significant amount of helium. Uh, the Wyoming field, the Labarge, Big Piney Labarge, um, is, is owned or controlled by Exxon. It's on BLM ground, which makes expansion difficult because it's next to a national forest that they won't allow expansion into. But certainly it would be benefit the helium market if they did. Uh, the bottom left is uh, some general statistics uh, showing you how much helium was extracted through time. And essentially, uh, 2021, because of the pandemic, we have a di di dip in, in consumption and production, but uh, it's already st started to go up. One of the problems with the helium uh, industry is it's not very transparent. There's basically six companies that buy and sell helium. They're not required to report anything, so this isn't something that's... Uh, uh, being caused by people not delivering data, but it's simply very few states. And I think Alberta and Saskatchewan and Arizona, maybe New Mexico and Utah are the only states that require provinces that require the uh, reporting of helium. Uh, Utah has a royalty. Uh, they take a royalty on the helium. I know that uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta do as well. I'm not sure about Arizona and New Mexico, but regardless, there's a lack of uh, transparency, which makes uh, collecting data and exploring and figuring out exactly the economics at times for the industry. Then on the bottom right is how many millions of cubic feet we, we supposedly have in the ground. As you can see that the U.S. is uh, at the top. One of the reasons probably is because the way the U.S. and Canada actually is we allow a lot of small independents to develop these resources without government interference that you would see in a lot of other countries, like uh, we'll talk a little bit about Tanzania. In Tanzania, um, I've experienced in some mining over there, and every time someone seems to, at least in the past, find something, they suddenly step in and try to take a piece or get a bigger piece or prevent you from selling your, your um, commodity. Regardless, though, U.S. and Canada right now have the most. Russia has a fair amount, but they keep seemingly have their plant facility blow up every six months. And then with the Ukrainian-Russian war, they're not exporting to any great degree right now. Now the processing facilities in US and Canada uh, restricted pretty much to the, 
the western part, central western part, or central midwestern part of the U.S. The Canadian ones, it's a general uh, dot up above. Uh, there's various facilities going in, North American helium, um, Royal helium, and there's a couple others, and I apologize if I don't if I don't remember their names right at the moment. But the big one, Exxon, is up in Labarge. Very unique deposit. It's an overthrust, very low grade. Whereas if you go to um, Central Kansas, where it says Messer and Air Products, we have higher higher grade there. And then if you want to go to much higher grade, it's in Arizona and New Mexico. But there's plants being planted, facilities being planned for down there as well. So this is all a work in project. And then the IECX facilities. They're a leader in putting in small um, units in a six month period as I've been quoted. And they have several of these around the country. Uh, these are small units that handle particularly one field or small fields. And uh, then they go off and sell their helium to the bigger boys like Air Products and uh, Lindy and Air Liquide. Economics, prices have risen as production has fallen well below demand in recent years. Uh, helium supply and production is presently stable because of the pandemic, so it's a little out of date slide. But essentially, right now, we're looking at five hundred to thousand dollars at the wellhead, probably more like five fifty, six hundred. Cost of finding and processing varies from one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars per MCF of gas, um, and then new reserves, as I said, potential from Russia and certainly from Qatar. This is a map done by uh, uh, Weissman and Eccles, a very good report for the state of Utah. Um, they put this map together with a lot of data. The reds, yellows, and blues are where the most prolific or higher number uh, helium are. And you notice that there's a lack of good helium data south into the uh, Texas Gulf Coast and then east into almost all the basins. I've tested a number of wells in eastern Kansas, and there is a small couple anomalous areas in Kentucky, and then the Michigan Basin in the Michigan Stray Sand, which is Mississippian age, seems to have elevated helium, but this could be just an oddity. Um, so far, there hasn't been any deeper helium detected. And one of the things about helium, it seems the deeper the, where you want to get a zone productive just above the um, uh, basement is your best bet, like the Deadwood uh, Sand up in uh, the Williston Basin, that is a big target of helium right now. Uh, sitting close to the basement where it essentially is your source, you'll accumulate as long as you have a good seal. But essentially, for the most part, over the years, Kansas, Texas, um, parts of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico have been the focus until Exxon um, or whoever noticed uh, Labarge uh, Field had helium started developing it there. The source of helium, we have 5.2 to 5.6 ppm in the atmosphere. Replacement constant, which... If, we are if the Earth is depleting of its helium, it certainly doesn't seem to be happening because we have a constant amount of helium in the atmosphere. So their estimations of how much helium is left in the Earth or potential is probably off. Uh, it's very hard to, to identify the source of helium because we just don't have wells drilling deep enough. Seismic obviously can't differentiate uranium and thorium minerals or those type of uh, uranite, uranite or those type of rocks. And then lithium is also seemingly contributing helium. No one's really done the work research, but there's a lot more lithium than uranium and thorium out there. So there may be that there's some of this additional helium is coming from that. Uh, the, H, the helium atom can leave the Earth's surface and never touch another atom. I already mentioned that. And like I said, there's problems with the HE, HE supply estimations. And any trap for helium is a temporary delay in leaving the Earth. So. There's a lot of good traps out there, but they can't hold helium. They can hold oil and gas and maybe some other uh, gases or, or, or fluids, but helium just and hydrogen, same thing, can move through a seal. So it's just a temporary trap that it's being, it's being delayed on its migration out. So this is the typical model for helium, migration from granites. Actually, it's, it's the same as in oil and gas, except our source rock is potentially several miles below us taking, and the helium will migrate rapidly if it can. Sometimes it gets trapped in various minerals, but then earthquakes release it or changes in tectonics or a variety of erosion uh, or removal of something can release it to go further up, the, up and then eventually it migrates to basically a closure. Uh, we rarely see, and there's a couple indications that helium may be trapped in strat traps, but typically on any structure, the best helium is seemingly found at the top of the structure. 
and I haven't reviewed all data out there, so I could be wrong in that. But for the most part, what I've mapped says that helium is, always sits at the top of the structure. So you could have a two mile long structure that's maybe a half a mile wide and helium might be only at one small part of it out of two wells and maybe 80 acres and the rest of it be barren. So the helium is a very interesting molecule and it doesn't accumulate a lot um, in many areas. And then finally, this is, uh, you know, what we're looking at is the seals is critical. Salts and anhydrites are the best. A thick shale section is good. Our typical reservoirs are sandstones or carbonates. As I mentioned, shales don't seem to be a good reservoir in the shale plays. We rarely see any helium of significance, at least from the data I've seen. So, and then the other thing uh, that we need to talk about is remobilization of helium in crustal sediments during uh, basin fluid ex expulsion. And this is probably what happened into the Yucatan and the Texas Panhandle based on several theories, which should be on the uh, left side of that map that you see in front of you where it says Texas Panhandle, Yucatan. We also like to see old pore water, which makes uh, some plays that are in the Cretaceous and Mesozoic, uh, uh, well, Mesozoic and tertiary section unlikely to be there, but we do have examples, for example, in the Los Animas County area, in the lion sand, which is Permian, well, it's upper Paleozoic, but still there's, it sits almost right on top of the basement. Then we have out at Harley Dome, which I'm very familiar with in Utah. It's out of the Entrada sand, but it sits probably 500 feet above the basement. Very prolific little field, but it's a little field, two or three wells. I understand they're expanding and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, classification of helium in terms of volume, low grade is less than a half percent. Most of the major fields in the world are of this type. They typically will be very low grade, moving um, millions of cubic feet of gas. So it's basically these types of fields that can extract helium economically because they're moving volumes of, of natural gas. Whereas on a small field, um, you may have 8%, but if you're only making 30 MCF a day, 8% of 30 MCF a day is not very economic. Of course, price is always the driving factor. The middle grade is about uh, from half a percent to one and a half percent. There's a lot of fields, Battle Creek up in Saskatchewan, Ryersea and Otis Albert in uh, Kansas. We see these type of fields also in Utah occasionally uh, that are really aren't being developed right now. Then everything high grade is over one and a half percent. And this is Harley Dome, uh, Dene B. Kia, apologize if it's mispronounced, Model Dome, Pinta, Salwash, Keys, Arrowhead in, in uh, Southeast Colorado. Um, these type of fields typically are small uh, in a small area. They tend to also, even within the structure or deposit, the helium contents can vary from well to well. It's entirely different animal than the uh, low grade deposits. So this is very much like if you're in, have been a lot of experience like I have in, in the gold markets in Canada on the TSX and the Vancouver Exchange. These are like gold deposits. They are very low, small percentage of what you're trying to, to get out of the ground. So that makes it even tougher in terms of uh, exploring and developing them. Some of the major producing areas in the US and Canada, this has expanded uh, since the beginning of the year because there's been a surge in helium drilling and production. We're seeing a lot of activity, especially in, in the Williston Basin in Canada, just over the border of Montana. And then we're also seeing a lot in Arizona um, and uh, New Mexico, as well as Los Angeles County and Colorado has taken off um, with some nice discoveries and we'll see how they develop down the road. But you can see from uh, a lot of these fields that are have made a lot of helium, most of them, um, the percentage is all over the board, but if we looked at the bigger ones, the lower grade, the bigger the field. Then overseas, um, believe it or not, most people don't know is Poland had multiple fields, very low grade, but over there it's a critical element. Those fields are very much in decline. Um, South Africa, the recent discovery of the Virginia field, I comment that it's a one-off because it seems that if uh, in areas where the rich water ran is producing gold. And if you have uranium in your, your conglomerate, they're finding helium. But there's parts of the rich water ran where there's no uranium in the gold deposits and there's no helium. So it, it could be a one-off or there could be others out there, but it's a very rich deposit. And right now it's uh, being very well developed and producing very nicely. Russia, the Amur 
processing plant is a uh, nightmare for the Russians. It seems every six months the plant blows up. Uh, at the recent helium conference in April in uh, Denver, uh, one of the speakers had a nice picture of the plant blowing up to demonstrate that. They uh, derive their helium from multiple fields close by, so we don't really know much about the geology. I'm assuming it's um, deposits that are close to the basement and a similar situation as some of the uh, older fields and developed fields that we see here in the U.S. Algiers, there is a lot more hel helium in Algiers, but the gas is actually being shipped to Europe right now, and they've ignored the helium simply because they may, they can make, I guess, more money with the just selling the gas at $20 an MCF or more. The last one, Qatar uh, and Iran. As far as the public knows, Iran is not developing uh, their helium, but for all we know, that helium with the gas could be shipped to the USSR, which they have connections to, and the helium could be stripped out there. But Qatar is very much stripping out the helium in the north and so north, south parts part of the field. The problem with this field is, is that pressure maintenance is critical. If it goes up or as it goes down, it can cause production to plummet. So it's a, it, and then also it's limited by uh, sanctions and politics. Uh, both countries seem to uh, earn the uh, dis, uh, displeasure of several majors off and on. And so their production could be shut in or partly sanctioned. Australia has been an interesting area. The exploration down there has been erratic, but they are starting to move helium out of the processing facilities. Tanzania is another interesting place. I've been following that for a while. Uh, the rocks are young, so that's a problem. And it, this is the second round of exploration. But I, you know, I, if they do find the helium down there, they're seeing seven, eight percent sometimes 10 or 11% in the gas flow. The problem is, we're talking a little bit is, uh, you know, is there a trap? Then China generally processing it or pulling it out of uh, the gas stream. There is a couple fields I think they're trying to develop, but I'm not really certain because the information, obviously from a socialist country, communist country like that is sometimes suspect or it's just not available. Okay, so this is the big Piney Labarge. It's a Madison producing field. It's main, its main uh, host gas is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is used in secondary recovery or tertiary recovery around Wyoming to move oil. If that all stopped, I'm not sure this field they, they move any helium out of, so I hope they keep going. There is some other smaller uh, structures out here that I know are being looked at and targeted for helium and for CO2. But you can see that it's a thrust. Um, and it's a very complex geology, well over pressured, um, but very big wells and uh, very complex geology. To the northwest, on the left side of the map, you go into the national forest. The structure continu continues in that direction. Unfortunately, it's now a national forest, and I don't believe the BLM would grant uh, any leases at this time. This is north and south pars. It sits on a, an arch, uh, Silurian age rocks. Uh, very, very prolific field in the most uh, fought over place in the world. Uh, so it's it's a fun place, but very low grade helium, but the helium they can pull out of this 1800 TCF gas is quite substantial. And they'll be a player for a long time to come. Uh, so that's very important to keep this area stable. And this is the structure once again, also on an arch, uh, three sandstones, I believe produce out of this, it's got a nice flow, but this is a, uh, this was from an older, uh, this structure was mapped in the sixties, I believe. And that's how long the field's been around. I don't think they started extracting helium until the seventies or eighties. So let's look at distribution of helium and natural gases in the central U S. Uh, essentially, uh, this map is also from Weissman and Eccles. And you can see that we have several areas, Los Animas Arch, and then just to this, between the, the word Texas Panhandle and uh, the circle for Los Animas Arch is a is Los Animas County uh, along the Pishaba Arch, which is a big play by I think three or four companies, primarily uh, Blue Helium and Double Eagle, I believe uh, that is going on right now. And then we have the Texas uh, Panhandle Hugoton, which is our historical production, the Russell Rib um, or Central Kansas Uplift. These are two areas have been producing since the 20s or so. Uh, actually, the first helium production in North America was actually in Ontario and Canada. 
but the war, World War I ended and it quickly moved out to, I think, the Bow Valley field in uh, Canada that started to see the first healing production on the continent. Four Corners area has been very prolific, and what's not shown on the map is uh, further south in Holbrook very well, and we'll get to talk about that. But essentially, this, this part of the, our country is very, very rich in helium for the most part. Here's the Texas Panhandle. Um, it's strictly a, believing, uh, a hydrologic trap. Uh, the best production is from structural highs and along the edges. The field is very well depleted, but it's still making a lot of gas and a lot of helium. Uh, the Admire and Chase groups are the main producing zones. Uh, where you see the Moro uh, production is to the west, near the, where the word Bradshaw's is. Going into uh, southeast Colorado, what's fascinating is there's some more tests down into the uh, below the Adams Admire and Chase groups, and they are barren of helium under the under the main Huguenin field. Let's move to uh, the Colorado Plateau. Very unique unique feature. Uh, subsequently, there's several fields. The upper left one was actually salt wash, which is under reactivation by a couple of companies. And it's, I put it as a structural nose. Some people have a closure. The problem with the logs is, is it's hard to interpret, but regardless, Amico found this field, made 11 BCF of gas. There's a report in the state records saying that um, they would make several millions of dollars uh, extracting the helium, because uh, I think it was at one and a half percent, I forget offhand, but Amico's personnel decided not to. Then the, just below that is the Den of the Keep field. I apologize again for it. It's an oil field, but it produces helium as well. And then to below that is the what was for years the only field in Holbrook, the uh, Pinto Navajo Springs uh, in Navajo Springs East fields, very shallow. Low pressure, but produces a lot of helium over time. Um, I can't even read what the field in the upper right, but it's another field in Arizona, which is very helium productive. Then the Lisbon field I put in here is simply because it, it's basically CO2 with very little or no helium. Lots of medium sized and small deposits, lots of teasers in the Colorado area, but some very good fields. There's just wells, a number of wells in Arizona and New Mexico, especially that have very high numbers, but they've never had good flow, whereas there's several other fields that have great numbers and great flow. This is a Harley Dome, greater Cisco field area. I'm very active in this area right now. The Harley Dome is like a pimple on a major uh, structural anticline uh, plunging into under uh, the Uinta Basin, I believe, along the Young Compadre uplift. And it's almost all nitrogen with HE from the Entrada. There's some gas in the the overlying Dakota, um, essentially, but it's two or three wells right now. Uh, they're trying to expand it, but it's been consistently making uh, pretty good helium over time. Uh, to replicate this is very hard, as we'll see in a moment going north, actually north and, and northeast into the Colorado uh, Plateau. There is helium in the gas, but it's nothing like the 7-8% that's here at Harley Dome. And then west uh, at Cisco Dome, Cisco Springs, uh, we it drops down. Now, most of the numbers, and Harley Dome is in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the Cisco Springs is the center field, and Cisco Dome is the field to the, to the left. That has almost no helium in it, and it's productive out of the Dakota, oil in, out of the Entrada. Cisco Springs, which is in the center, where it says 2% HE in the Morrison and 6 to 8% HE in the Entrada. Looking south of that, you'll see that it's 0.2 to 1% helium in the C Dakota. There's actually a sample from the Pennsylvanian in there in the records. I'm not sure there's Pennsylvania rock there, but it was at, at one and a half parts per, uh, percent. And so right now the play there is, is to go look at the Entrada, which has almost no wells into the, the structure there uh, that goes into any of the Entrada sands. And the Entrada generally only produces from structural highs. And then this is just a model showing the migration of uh, helium upwards into these various traps. Uh, simple, simply put, Harley Dome is thought to have the helium migrate up from basement rocks and faulting, which that's basically the model for most of the areas. Uh, Yucatan, Texas Panhill are somewhat different. This is the Holbrook Basin. Uh, these maps were not in my books. Uh, the one on the left wasn't, uh, simply because I, I ran out of time to put a lot of good data in. But essentially, we have uh, the active areas, the St. John's Field on the bottom, right corner, 
of the map to the left, and then the other area to the to the uh, the map on the right, the upper left area. Uh, this is an area that was looked at for helium years ago, then Desert Mountain uh, came in and started trying to get it going, and recently they stopped and moved to uh, West Texas. My understanding it was something to do with not being able to get fracking permits or the reservoirs weren't producing as well. Regardless, it's still got a lot of high helium, and I'm sure they'll figure it out eventually. The production here is from Permian rocks. Uh, there is a deeper section, but it seems that the best location for the helium seems to be in the Kokuno sandstone, the Triassic Shinrum conglomerates in sandstone are the main producing uh, section, helium section. This is the Pinta Dome, Navajo Springs. A uh, number of faults have been mapped. Faulting is critical to any helium field. If you don't see any faulting on your seismic, you run a very high risk of not finding anything. Another problem is, for example, up in Saskatchewan is you have some nice bumps, but they have no Cambrian sands over them, which means the helium didn't accumulate. It might accumulate in younger zones, and that has been the case in a couple of cases. But essentially, this is at 1,000 feet. And what's also interesting, as I'll mention later, the higher numbers of uh, helium seem to be associated with under-pressured reservoirs with a good seal over them at shallow depths, whereas your deeper reservoirs seem to have very low helium, but great pressures and large, large reserves. And then this is the recent activity that Desert Mountain's doing. Uh, reservoirs are poorly developed. They're erratic from well to well. And, but essentially, we see some good numbers. Uh, some wells are water-free, some are not. And one of the interesting things about the helium percentage is they will change through time. Uh, there's been cases in Kansas where people have put put uh, wells in and build plants and suddenly the helium disappears from the gas stream after four or five months. So you have to be very careful um, in, in evaluating your reservoirs and, and the, the gas in place before putting a plant in. The other thing is a, a high flow of 24 million a day is one well here. I believe it is about 2000 feet, but this is shallow. My guess is uh, that it dropped considerably. And uh, it's essentially, like I said, these Erratic reservoirs uh, make it difficult to maintain production sometimes. And finally, St. John's, this field has a few BCF of, uh, uh, of CO2. Uh, it's got 1%, 0.9% of helium, very large structure, lots and lots of gas. It's selling, I believe it sold at least one uh, truckload and uh, it's, a, it's a huge structure. Uh, the only problem is getting rid of 9 TCF of CO2. It takes a lot of uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi bottles to take that, but uh, they, I believe they're working on it. Or they have to inject it back into the ground, which is another issue trying to get a CO2 injection well nowadays through the EPA. And the downside when you have CO2 as your host rock is your tubulars have to be stainless steel or some other metals in order to prevent corrosion and, and loss, of, uh, loss of integrity. Typical fields in Kansas, one on the left is actually in the Hugoton trend. It's a very old, this field is very old, so the data is very limited. This is from published data. And you can see that there's little uh, structures within the structure. And it's usually at the top of these structures that you get the best helium. But even when you get a lower structure well, you still got some helium, so you can still make it work with, with uh, economies of scale. The one on the right is the Otis Albert field, which uh, the Cambrian sands sit right underneath the Cherokee formation, which is its seal. As a matter of fact, once the once the rocks between the Cherokee and the and the uh, uh, Cambrian sand start coming back in off the flanks, you don't see any gas accumulation or helium, uh, basically helium accumulation anymore. This is a big area for years. It's still making some gas, but it's in also in serious decline. This is the riser field. This field was producing oil for a while. Then someone actually looked at the economics and found that it, it can actually make uh, uh, helium. It's a nice little field for an independent, um, and it's a well-defined structure. Los Animas Arch. Um, so here is the helium data for the Los Animas Arch. You can see, and most of the, the red spots um, where the, the, the ellipse to the left is are in the moral. And then a Pishaba uplift area, that's Permian, that's the Los Animas uh, County play. And then as you go down into the Yucatan, you notice that uh, the numbers drop off dramatically. And except for the Keys field down there, which is Morrow and Keys, 
the helium numbers drop off in many of the um, Moro wells. We have a great seal, Cherokee and Atoka uh, shales, just a ton of it just sitting on top of this stuff uh, is allowed the uh, helium to stay in the Moro. We rarely see any helium accumulations in the Mississippian. Basically, there's no real seal over it. This is all, uh, all wells of all geologic ages, just going back to this. And you can see the basement fracturing faulting. The Precambrian rocks under the Apishabal uplift near the Los Amos Arch area are, are, are very different. It's probably one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of helium. And then the main helium areas for the Moro are concentrated in Cheyenne and Kiowa County. As you go away from that, the helium is still present, but it drops off and is not as economic. Moro wells only. Once again, as I pointed out, that there's really not much more uh, gas with helium in it under the Huguenton embayment. And then the Los Angeles Archeries region area, you can see the Permian, uh, the, the um, excuse me, the numbers over the uh, Huguenton, they're lower than what's at the Pishapa. The Huguenton is probably 1% to 2% or one to one and a half. And the Pishapa area is 8%. So that's a very hot play right now for, for very much that reason. This is uh, the Arrowhead field, this field, um, right now, if anybody's drilling in Southeast Colorado, the only real reason is either for oil or for helium. And this would make eight, this field would have made 89, and it may have 89 million cubic feet of helium just from the gas, um, extracting from the gas. The Model Dome, uh, this is a nice size structure. It's had uh, the fourth expiration, uh, expiration area is underway. Um, and simply for years, there was only a couple of wells producing, several other wells tested. Well, one of the issues may be is that the uh, lion sand is so permeable that it, you can drain a large area, or it could just have been economics why those wells weren't completed. But there, there basically is only a couple wells, and you can see the faults and dikes, and that probably has helped with the helium migration. These are from Blue Heliums, really, really nice diagrams. The pay column is 13 to 30, 34 feet. They actually on the Raton side of the Pishapa uplift at 2.2% in Pennsylvania, which I think is pretty exciting. Uh, they've really uh, come a long way in doing some good work. Um, the lines is a sheet of sand, and there's the, we, I do know that there's variation in production uh, with the other company between wells, which is implying that there's high variability in the reservoirs. However, you can, the Model Dome has made a lot of money and even at low volumes, low pressure, you can still make money with the high prices. And then this is finally uh, just a summary of what I was just talking about. And again, this is their model for migration. I don't know what the Los Angeles formation is. I, I like to see the log someday to see if it's uh, basically fountain, but essentially uh, the lions is where the trap is because there's probably a lack of reservoir rocks in the Pennsylvania. Northwest flank of the Williston Basin. Uh, subsequently, this area has been developed off and on, but recently it's been really pushed hard. First of all, there's a lot of nitrogen and in some cases CO2 with the, with the helium. So it comes across as very green. Um, but the only downside to that is with no hydrocarbons, and there's a couple of places that have, they're recovering condensate and that sort of thing, is that your power has to come from somewhere else and that adds a major uh, cost to your operations and any downturn in prices, it might shut you down. Uh, the percentage of healings around here is anywhere from 0.4 to 1%, uh, very, very low helium. But the nice thing is you can vent the high, uh, nitrogen to the atmosphere in most of the cases. And the Canadian sector is, is growing. Uh, Royal Helium Steelville is placed online and producing, and this is a field that has 0.2 to 0.4% helium and 15 million a day uh, from wells. And so it's one of those, don't know how large the deposit yet, we'll see with time, but essentially it could be one of those uh, low grade deposits. And then this is just uh, examples. I noticed that the pushing time a little bit here, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit, I apologize. Um, but this is where the helium play is. As it goes into Montana, uh, Ruddard Field, I was involved with for a little bit, has good helium and then the, uh, uh, Kevin Sunburst Dome has got several areas with helium in it, same 1%, sometimes CO2, sometimes nitrogen, structural, all structural. And then on this slide, the one on the right is the, the Ruddard Field. Uh, it's in the Cambrian and Red River, uh, but the reservoir rocks are very tight in certain areas. There's shallow oil above it in the um, Eagle Springs, I think. 
And then these are examples that uh, I take I took from various uh, companies' uh, presentations, uh, Canadian companies that are public. And you can see they're all nice little structures, but they are little. And uh, the steel wheel is up in the upper right. Uh, it's a fairly good size structure compared to some of the others. But essentially what you, you really need to be aware is that this is probably – Helium is probably truly a structural play just because of the nature of helium. Tanzania, um, this play started in the 50s with the British and they abandoned it. They couldn't find where the helium was accumulating. The, the springs and stuff were uh, have it 8%, 10, 11% in various areas. But then uh, helium one came at, out here about, I think, four or five years ago and started developing it. And now they've shot some great seismic. I understand their first test finally reached TD and they're completing it. Wish them the best of luck. Uh, nice seismic, uh, great looking traps everywhere. Uh, the problem is if this was oil, they might find oil and gas, uh, is that because of the, the fracture broken up reservoir, it might be difficult to accumulate helium. And also the constant tectonic activity, moving, moving rocks around might allow traps to be breached and, or reaccumulated but not lasting very long. But it, it's some really great looking geology. Same thing again. I mean, if that was uh, somewhere else like in the Gulf Coast, I think uh, everybody would be excited about drilling that, but it, you're in a rift area, which has a lot of its own risks. Other areas that potentially produce is, um, uh, simply put, oh, well, the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, I know a company in there, very active, trying very hard. Possibly found some oil, but they had some good helium. Uh, the West Pecos Slope has also got helium. It's it's low grade, five percent, half of one percent, um, but it's still a nice, consistent production area. And then down in Kentucky, there's an area because you have a rift, and rift seems to, old rifts seem to be a good place to go and look. And exploration and development takes a lot of effort in these places. How do I evaluate helium? Not so easy. Almost all states do not keep records of HE production. Alberta and Saskatchewan do, and as I mentioned, Utah, Arizona, and uh, New Mexico seem to. The federal government talks to a lot of people and puts out some reports, but people aren't required to talk to them, um, from what I understand. And then collecting data on what, what wells produce helium requires a lot of, requires a lot of investigation, because in Kansas, if anybody's worked in Kansas, it's hard to get fine data sometimes. It's gotten better over the past few years for oil and gas, but helium is still nothing needs to be submitted. And then three types of helium plays are uh, low, medium, and high grade. How do I evaluate a helium play? Well, large deposits tend to have either carbon dioxide or nitrogen as the host gas, or in the case of cutter, hydrocarbons. Large deposits are less than half of 1%. Large deposits have tens of BCF of helium as a result. Helium is not the primary director of large deposits. Small deposits, and have higher percentages. Higher the better, it seems. Small deposits tend to be shallow and under pressure, probably allow, allows the HE to be retained temporarily with an effective seal. Small deposits tend to have erratic reservoirs in terms of highly variable helium in the offsetting wells. So small deposits can be great. Harley Dome is a case in point. Some of the fields in Arizona and New Mexico as well, but then there's a lot of uh, wells with great helium, but no, no uh, reserves or no great ex extent of the uh, reservoir. Another tool is uh, looking at the ratios between the helium and nitrogen. Nitrogen is always associated with helium in some percentage. The two are not really related, but they probably come from a similar source or sources. Um, and helium doesn't react with anything, as I mentioned earlier, so it's hard to have a pathfinder tool uh, like we do with oil and gas, with things like iodine or that sort of thing. What characters that make a helium pipe work? Structure critical, reservoir, sandstone, limestone, or dolomite, um, near basin tectonic activity or large scale basin expulsion. Productive fields tend to be at the intersection of basin faults based on gravity and magnetics. And I didn't talk about that at Cisco Springs, but all of the good helium numbers that we see are at the intersections of two different directions of basin faults. Other people are saying the same thing for in the Colorado Plateau, especially in. Uh, Arizona and New Mexico and Southern Colorado. Paley's rock or older is generally the main target, but younger and younger rocks create a higher risk. The greater the volume of gas, the lower the HE presence need to be, to be economic. And then the host gas can be in any combinations. Exploration methods, go look through existing databases, um, testing existing gas wells for helium, 
There's people testing gas seeps all over the world for helium, like up in Greenland. Uh, Minnesota recently had a helium uh, discovery up there from three or four years ago. And a company is now trying to determine if it is a, uh, has a accumulation of larger extent. But certainly in, in those type of deposits, they are um, going to be difficult to define because once you get into uh, igneous and mafic rocks, reservoir becomes a major problem. It's generally all fracturing. Areas of thermal activity, aeromagnetics and gravity, uh, critical. Surface geochemistry, for those some of you who know me, I'm big into surface geochemistry for oil and gas. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, we do see helium anomalies over helium fields, but they're very small and localized. If you have 200 samples, you might get 10 or 11. A very statistically small number um, over the seismic. Pretty much you want to be on the top of the structure to start. You don't want to be on the flank because you might drill a dry hole, but the helium still may be in economic quantities at the top of the structure. And then drilling always ruins a good prospect because uh, you find out what went wrong. And many helium projects are uneconomic with limited reserves after testing, doing flow tests and that sort of thing. Development of uh, and processing methods. Development of helium resources is almost the same thing as developing natural gas except for the processing helium plant. Very expensive. Um, it just takes a few months to uh, maybe 18 months to get a plant. And once you, the money you put into that, it could be equivalent to the initial drilling of a few wells. But if when you start flowing the gas and and the helium isn't there, then you've wasted a lot of money. And that scares most um, companies off. Now, in most cases, we're using PSAs or membrane uh, plants and not cryogenic, which are far more expensive. And you really need larger, larger volumes of gas to justify those. Some comments about completion and production. You know, the people going around saying they have 10, uh, 15 feet, 100 feet of peg. Well, the nature of helium is it's going to sit at the top of the pay. You're not going to find it all through the entire pay zone. Even a five-foot zone, they, most of the helium, the greater amount of helium would be at the top of the pay. And that's something to remember when completing. You don't want to perforate the entire zone unless you're really sure that it's got helium all through it. Flow tests, observe any decline over a couple of weeks or more. may be critical to determine if the reservoir is limited. Um, helium sometimes disappears, declines to low amounts, even with the best gas flow. Fracking a reservoir seems to be the completion method of last resort. Fracking may not be a good idea. And the low pressure, low res, pressure reservoirs like uh, Los Angeles Arch, um, Arizona, uh, that sort of things. And the reason is, is that I have experience when trying to frack a low pressure reservoir for oil and watching my frack go up 150 feet. It's very, very difficult to get keep your frack under um, your barrels per minute low and that sort of thing. Uh, I've done it in coal bed methane wells at 600 to 1500 feet but it's, it's not always easy. And lack of hydrocarbons is okay if you're green focused, but negative from a power cost and commodity price deadline, uh, decline, excuse me. Uh, reservoirs that are lenticular or different characteristics in an area, but are, but are processed at the same plant may cause production issues. So if you have different fields with different gas quality, you may have some issues. Finally, uh, helium is a critical element needed for modern society. Uh, we it's coming from uranium and thorium decay and lithium decay. Uh, some of it was trapped when the earth was formed. The major majority of helium is produced by U.S., Qatar, Algiers, and Russia, but that is changing. The central part of the mid-continent, central and southern Rockies, is the area of U.S. production, southeast Alberta and south, southwestern Saskatchewan. Finding these reserves is difficult. Recovering the helium from the gas stream is expensive. Purchaser of the helium is limited to six companies mitigated by selling directly mitigate this by selling directly to the end user. However, helium does provide a unique financial financially opportunity for sm small companies if they're willing to make the commitment to define a project. And then some of these companies that buy helium will fund building of the plants if they feel the reserves are justified. Thank you very much. Oh, that was great. Thanks. So um, I just noticed that um, our president of of um, energy of the division of environmental geosciences is here. Or um, Bert, do you want to say something as we start looking? As feel free to open up your camera and and microphone. And oh, there you are. 
Um, yeah, uh, great presentation. I don't know a whole lot about helium, uh, and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, thanks a whole bunch, Stephen. No problem. Uh, yeah, and uh, for any of you who uh, aren't aware of the Division of Environmental Geosciences and want to get involved in us, uh, uh, with us, uh, by all means, please let me know. Uh, you can find us on the AAPG uh, website. Yeah, that's great. So, um, Steve, you might stop sharing your your screen so we can uh, get people in here. And okay. on the other hand, you might want to go back through the. No. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I was thinking. Well, on the other hand, we might want to go back through some of the slides. We have quite a few questions. So I don't know if you saw the ones in the chat. Um, if somebody wants to just go ahead and open up their microphone and, and, and do the chat, you can, or I can read the question. We have a question, um, I'll just start at the top. Um, Jose Ilalis has said, thanks Stephen, good presentation. What do you consider a good helium volume to make it attractive to invest? Actually, I put it on the chat is uh, if you got a high percentage, like uh, four or five, eight percent, 200 to 300 MC a day, because that's Harley Dome. And I'm I'm sure after a while, it'll be some of the Los Angeles County wells and other areas that are shallow. Um, if it's one to two percent or half of one percent, then you'd want something at a million a day um, because it, you, you have to move more volume to make it economic. John Node. Um... Hi, John. John's in Canada. Uh, so, um, mentions that nitrogen fields in Iran are also devoid of helium. So Istvan Nagi Korodi says, excellent presentation. Thank you and congrats. Do you happen to observe helium fractionation within the reservoir? I mean, is there any helium concentration difference between the gas field top versus bottom part of it? Thank you for the answer in advance. Um, that was interesting about the, uh, I'll answer, uh, you made a comment about Iran. I didn't know about that. That's interesting. Germany has some massive nitrogen fields with no helium in them. So we do know that uh, the nitrogen can be that present without any helium in areas. So that has something to do with the source. And as I indicated in the uh, uh, Virginia field in South Africa, where there's no uranium and thorium mineralization, there's no helium. So uh, obviously, uh, the source is not always uniform, and, and someone has to remember that. And then in fractionation, as I indicated, um, the reservoirs can be highly variable and from well to well in certain areas. In other areas, it seems that the most helium is at the top, structural top. It seems to migrate to the highest point. And so, and then a, if you have a reservoir that's uh, maybe overpressured, your helium might be uniform through a few feet of hay, but it seems that helium tries to get to the top. And we also don't see many fields with oil. Uh, the oil uh, seems to push out the helium when it migrates into a field. So most of our helium comes, uh, almost all of it, except for a couple, a couple cases, comes from fields of natural gas or CO2 or nitrogen and not from oil fields. Hope that answers the question. Okay, so could you comment further on the association of hydrogen with helium? Uh, there is no association. Uh, hydrogen seems to be even more unique in certain areas. The hydrogen that I'm seeing is in the mid-continent rift from wells. I actually drilled a well in Lincoln County, Colorado. We had a tremendous amount of probably 5 to 10% hydrogen while drilling. We could never figure out where it came from. The offsetting wells had no hydrogen. Uh, that was in the, the Jolly Ranch field, which really was uneconomic either anyway. But essentially, the two don't seem to be walking hand in hand. I know the, an area in the mid-continent, they're finding both helium and hydrogen together, but that would make sense because it's a Precambrian rift system. Um, and also, I don't know what causing the hydrogen, whether it's coming from the Precambrian or it's chemical reactions in the minerals or what it is. So I don't see a real association between the two. But then here's the other thing is, most people never analyze for hydrogen when they do uh, analyze for helium in the uh, many areas. Super so I really don't know. Okay, so um, Hani El Shahawi said, thank you, very real informative talk. Um, Maggie Dalthorpe, in the Hugoton Panhandle field, do 
do you find any helium in the oily panhandle field area, or is the helium limited to the gas area? Uh, I believe it's mainly, there's, I think there is some in the oil area, but the majority of it's in the gas area. Okay, good. Um, let's see. That was the last of those. Let me, let me look in the Q&A. Uh, Q&A just... Oh, Salim Shaker, great presentation. My question, can we generate a prospect for helium wildcats or screen existing fields only? Well, if you get it, if you go around sampling or getting the data from an existing field, that's how a lot of people have been exploring in certain areas. Um, then you have areas like Arizona where there's previous wells drilled for helium. So they had something to key off of new areas uh, you know, basically, for example, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, I don't know, half a dozen to a dozen companies went out and leased all of the ground, paying lots of money, shooting big 3Ds, and then uh, sort of built it in they will come attitude, which is working, uh, where they shoot uh, and find all these little discrete structures and then they start drilling. Um, I've been following a partner of North American Helium, I think it's Helium Evolution. And it seems like the first two or three wells were not economic because lack of reservoir, no, no real understanding of what, what the problem was, but they, they did run pipe on a couple wells, but that's the problem with uh, doing uh, sort of what a typical oil and gas play uh, would, you would do is leasing a million acres and shooting seismic and then hopefully finding a lot of structures full of hydrocarbons. Helium is more unique. Only 17% of the well gas wells in the U.S. have any indication of helium, and it might it might be higher, it might be less. It's just we haven't analyzed all the natural gas wells in the U.S. So uh, that's one way to approach it. But at the same point, that's a high risk play, especially if you drill five or six dry holes in a row. You hit a couple producers to start and drill five or six dry holes, then you're probably okay. Okay, that's super interesting. And I just can't believe we've had such a great turnout and so many questions. So I'd like to encourage anyone who has a final question to um, jump in there and ask away. Uh, feel free to um, not be shy and <laughs> turn on your microphone and, and, and video. But at any rate, what companies do you suggest we contact if we have a hydrogen or helium discovery most likely to be interested in helping us to develop it? Uh, well, generally, uh, if you're looking for processing companies, that's uh, Miss Air and Air Liquid, Air Products, Lindy, are generally the bigger companies that uh, you want to talk to. Yeah, because sometimes they will, like I said, uh, we talked to them about financing the uh, financing uh, a processing plan. And so they will, they will go. They will look into that. Uh, but then, you know, it just it just depends on how much uh, uh, helium is in and how much uh, reserves, uh, total reserves there are. So, in other words, if you have 100 BCF of gas and three three BCF of helium, you probably can get funded from somebody right now because there's a lot of a lot of people trying to get into the helium space because it's because of the price. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah, but I mean, you've touched on the costs and the complications of finding helium where you have a lot of, of nitrogen or CO2 to work with or dispose of. Right. Um, do you see any technological breakthroughs or techno new technologies coming along? There's been a couple of people at the, the Helium Summit in April in Denver um, who are working on processing processing facilities that were a third of the price. Uh, but to date, I don't think they've made any real headway. I think it's just the nature of helium. It's it's like hydrogen. It just takes a lot of energy to get it out of the, uh, the gas stream. Interesting. Do we need a conventional or unconventional tight reservoir? Well, helium is pretty small. Uh, unconventional reservoirs typically don't seem to have any helium in them, even with the gas. So my guess is 
the uh, shales don't act as much of a trap for the helium. Mm -hmm. So it's a conventional reservoir you're looking for. And and like you pointed out, granite fractures, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's going to be uh, helium and hydrogen uh, accumulations found in the, in the granitic basement uh, because we see that discovery in, in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I think it was 8% helium at 1,200 feet. Uh, the only problem is, is that uh, it was found with a um, mining rig, which does not have a blowout preventer. Uh, when they drilled into the zone with the, the gas and 8-10% helium, the core barrel was blown out over the rig, and supposedly they never found it again. But after a few days, and they didn't flow test it, but they were able to plug the well. So based on my experience, that probably means that well is only moving about probably 30 to 50 MCF a day because you would need to get a serious uh, completion, a, an oil and gas completion rig up there to kill it. But they were able to kill it with what they had, which mining companies don't have anything with substance that can uh, kill gas wells that are, you know, a million a day. So. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so um, last question is, um, have there been any areas, oh my goodness, okay, so, it's moving fast. I was reading it and then it scrolled down. Um, have there been areas of more or less HE3 versus helium-4? Thanks. Well, helium-4 is uh, is uh, basically uh, the most common for type. H3 is, out of, is helium from the sun. So it requires fusion. So we what helium-3 we see in the subsurface was trapped there in the formation of the Earth. And then the U.S. and Russia have some uh, power plants or nuclear plants that generate H3 for um, academic research because because they don't want it to give it to any just anybody. Okay, okay. So then we've got from Joel Albert's comments. I worked at a cryogenic plant owned by a helium wildcatter in the '80s when helium was not in demand. After DSTs and detailed lab work, we still have prospects. Just having a hard time finding patient partners. Welcome to with the world. <laughs> That's true of oil and gas right now too, because of the the Biden administration and the environmentalists. They made it hard to raise money, even for helium, and helium is critical to help every all these young kids with keeping their cell phones. So if if you started taking away their cell phones because there was no helium, I'm sure they'd be fine with fossil fuels and na natural gas. <laughs> Funny. Based on current demand, when will helium supplies be exhausted? Uh, really unknown. Um, because helium, you know, it's really hard to say because uh, helium is mo constantly migrating. And some of these reservoirs you may shut down for a while and it might rebuild back up. It's, it's just unknown. And people are starting to think about drilling deeper into the granite to find more fractured reservoirs. And there's probably a lot of deposits out there in various tectonic or geologic situations that we've not really um, thought about or developed. The Tanzania model uh, area, there could be a lot of helium there. And if there is, there's probably lots and lots of helium there. It's just a matter of finding out, um, uh, you know, where the traps are. And I see someone commented about H3, HE3 on the moon. That is quite correct. The amount of helium up on the moon is substantial. It would supply all our needs for a thousand years or more. Uh, there's even a movie, movie out with uh, Sam Rockwell. It's a great little movie to watch about uh, the mining of helium, which is in the background to the story. But essentially, the Chinese have also started landing stuff on the moon, trying to set up a helium plant. The problem is, is getting the helium back from the moon to the Earth. Uh, it's not exactly uh, easy to transport. Helium likes to leave things. Hydrogen is even worse. Uh, containers are it's very difficult for them to keep helium and hydrogen very long. I think after six weeks, uh, these truckloads, the helium might, you might lose 10% or 3% of your helium just sitting there. So it, it gets out. And so getting it from one place to another is, can be very difficult if it's long distances. Yeah, I think um, you're probably responding to Joe Dixon's comment about Harrison Schmidt, so there's a lot of helium on the moon. Yeah, there is. <laughs> cool. Um, 
Well, that also makes us think about the dwarf planets. <laughs> uh, okay. I have a hat that says, uh, drill Earth first and the rest later. Is that what you're implying? <laughs> I was just thinking of the new, um, the, the new uh, NASA missions now are going to go to the dwarf planets to see what's going to do. Um, series. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, it looks like we're out of time. We've kind of exceeded our limit, but it was fine because we had lots of engagement and great questions and lots of thanks in the chat. Just thanks to you and the in the uh, audience. And thank you, Bert uh, Vogler, for mentioning the Division of Environmental Ge Geosciences. And again, um, make sure to join or renew AAPG. And it's um, super exciting. You will re be receiving an email with a link to the recording and information about upcoming um, exciting webinars. In fact, we have one this Thursday on borehole integrity for orphan wells. And we have a, a webinar after, the th after Thanksgiving on critical minerals. And then we'll have one on hydrogen as well. So thanks everyone. And I'll keep everybody updated. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending.